Aloha. What a delight to welcome you to our final devotional of this semester, 1994. We welcome you, we welcome our visitors, and I would like to acknowledge several people on the stand and elsewhere in the audience before we begin. On the stand we have Dr. and Sister Truman and Ann Madsen, who will be speaking to us today. It is a delight to have them with us because they represent the first presenters of a series of lectures that will be ongoing on the Prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, on this campus, and we're delighted that they could inaugurate this lecture series at this time. Uh, Dr. Madsen will be speaking tonight at what time? 7.30, where? Okay, tomorrow night, 7.30, here in the Canon Activity Center, he will be speaking uh, to us as well as this morning. I would also like to acknowledge in the audience, two of our friends from Mongolia, uh, Dr. Chadra, could you please stand please, and his companion, Dr. Bakhtaru from Mongolia. We'd like them to know how much we appreciate their being with us today. <laughs> Dr. Chadra is a key figure in education in Mongolia and has a close association with our uh, service missionaries who were there teaching in the universities in Mongolia. We'd also like to recognize Dr. LeVar Bateman and his wife who are our public affairs people in this area. Brother Bateman, could you stand to be recognized? Thank you very much. We recognize him because he is a former faculty member on the Provo campus and he even taught on this campus and we're delighted to see him and Sister Bateman back with us. Also on the stand are members of the President's Council, our ASBYU officers, our BYU stake presidents, our wonderful friend from the Polynesian Culture Center, President Lester Moore, our alumni representative, Moana Chrisman, President Ho and Sister Ho of the Hawaii Temple. We're so delighted that they could be with us today. By way of announcements, Tonight, or excuse me, tomorrow night will be our annual Christmas lighting. Uh, it will begin at 5.30. I think the announcements that went out said 6, but it will be 5.30. This is an annual event. It should be a lot of fun. It's a community BYU PCC uh, affair, and it's always uh, fun to be in attendance. I'd also like to announce that on Saturday, there will be a two-mile fun run. 8 o'clock, uh, over $400 worth of prizes will be given out. Please sign up today and be at the McKay Foyer 745 if you want to be on that, on that run. We haven't w heard from our women's volleyball team today, but yesterday they won their two games, and which means they're still alive in the, in the tournament, and they play today if they win this, or this afternoon they will be in uh, the final eight for the national championship. So we're all rooting for them. We'd like now to begin our services by singing Praise to the Man, conducted by Jim Smith. Emma Ernestberg is at the organ, after which Siana Burgess, a senior majoring in political science and Pacific studies, will offer the invocation, after which uh, Brandon Rahm, a tenor, will sing I went home, accompanied by Marlies Navalta.
our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day and for the many blessings which thou bestows upon us. Upon, upon us. We're thankful for Brother Matson and his wife Anne and for their being here with us to share with us their knowledge and their testimonies pertaining to the gospel. We pray that thy spirit will be upon Brother Madsen as he speaks to us today, that he may speak under thy influence. And we pray especially that thy spirit may be upon each and every one of us, that our hearts and minds may be open to what he has to say, and that we may all each leave here gaining something of value. We pray for these things humbly in the name of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. This song is based on a talk by Marvin J. Ashton, which stressed the value of early spiritual training in the home. It tells how Joseph Smith, when he had his glorious vision, desired most of all to go home and share it with his family. It was there in my home that I learned long ago the lessons that carried me through. All the trials and strife that stood in my path as from child to man I grew. It was there in my home that I learned how to play, how to work, and the meaning of love. I learned from example the power of prayer. I grew close to my Father above. My family so close, how we laughed, how we sang, how we prayed. I learned from my family the lessons of life. I grew in my mind unafraid. Then on that clear spring morning, I went to the grove as a youth. I needed to have an answer. I went in search of truth. And after that glorious moment, when they had talked to me, I rose from my knees. I ran up the path. I wanted the world to see. That the lessons I'd learned through those 14 years were not meant for me alone. I knew what to do. I knew where to go. I went home. I went home. I went home. Thank you very much, Brandon and Marlies. Before I invite Sister Ann Madsen to introduce her husband, I would like to say a couple of things. One, uh, I would like to get it straight with all of us. When 
uh, Brother Madsen will be speaking again. He will be speaking tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock here in the Cannon Activity Center to all the faculty and staff. Uh, no one will be excluded, but this is particularly for the faculty and staff. And then tomorrow night at 7.30 will be the last lecture uh, here in the Cannon Activity Center at 7.30. The address tomorrow afternoon will be Joseph Smith's vision of the future church. And tomorrow evening, Joseph Smith, the man and the prophet. The second thing I would like to say is that I do not know of any scholar in the church who has had as much or any more impact for good in the lives of literally tens of thousands of young people and people everywhere with regard to life, love, everlasting life. Uh, Elder Madsen is, Brother Madsen is the kind of author and speaker you like to take home with or take home with you uh, in a book or an article or a tape and listen to again and again and again. I've had the privilege of reading much of what he has written and I have quoted much. And uh, especially I hope that I can live much of what he teaches. So with that uh, a brief comment about Brother Madsen, I'd like Ann to come forward now and uh, tell us the rest. It's a unique experience to get to introduce my husband to you, and I, uh, I, I am privileged to be able to do that. I think I'd like to say how wonderful that music was and how grateful I am personally. Brother Daly, Brother Rogers, and the brother who sang it, the sister who played, so that we could all experience a little more about the prophet Joseph Smith. I think the thing that attracted me to Truman Madsen at the University of Utah when we met 45 years ago, he hates for me to say how long ago it was, <laughs> um, was his testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith and his strength of testimony. We were married uh, after I graduated from the university and went directly to Harvard where, we, where he studied for four years. And I gave birth to our two first children, the first of our four children. Um, we returned to Brigham Young University after he received his PhD. You might be interested in one little interesting um, sidelight of our Harvard years. I came home from work. I was working uh, to begin with before we had our family. And um, I came home one day and he was reading in the Doctrine and Covenants in the Book of Mormon. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> you're supposed to be studying Kant. You're supposed to be studying philosophy. <laughs> How come you're studying? You know, I, I was worried that he was wasting time. And he said to me, you know, Anne, if I'm to uh, survive this PhD program, I'm going to have to be just as learned about the prophet Joseph Smith and what he said about philosophy as I am about all the other philosophers that I'm studying. I didn't ever chastise him anymore for not studying the books from Harvard. <laughs> uh, we returned to Brigham Young University uh, where he taught for five years and then were called on a mission to preside over the New England mission and we moved back to Cambridge, Massachusetts again. That was a wonderful time of our lives with 500 young missionaries who came to serve there with us. We went back to the university again after that service and more lately in our lives we've spent from 1987 until 1993 living in Jerusalem, Israel, with one year uh, home in between, where for the last two of those years, my husband was the director of the Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. I think he'd want you to know that we have four children and 16 grandchildren. Um, we just spent Thanksgiving with one of our, the family 
members in our family and uh, in California. And our daughter Mindy, when they picked us up from the, uh, the airport, our grandson, who was just baptized this summer, said, Max, he said, Papa, tell me about Joseph Smith and the snake. The two men looked at him, <laughs> and Mindy explained. She said, Dad, I told Max that he could ask you, he could play a game all the time you're here. He could say, tell me about Joseph Smith and, and then fill in anything, and you'd be able to tell him. And so we played that game all the time we were there. And the day that we left, Truman walked Maxwell to the bus to go to school, raised up his hands and said bye to him. Mindy called that night at to see that we got home safely on the plane and said, Max came home from school and he was really sad. He said, when Papa put his arms up and said goodbye to me, I realized I hadn't asked him enough questions about Joseph Smith yet. So we're looking forward to going back and filling him in. I began by saying that it was Truman's testimony of Joseph Smith, I think, that drew me to him when we were young. I remember when I first knew for myself that Joseph Smith was a prophet when I was 14 years old. And from that time on, I had an insatiable desire to learn more. So I married the man <laughs> who could teach me all the rest of my life more about the prophet Joseph Smith. I commend him to you today. He'll be speaking to you about Joseph Smith and the sources of spirituality. Dear brothers and sisters, we've never received a warmer welcome anywhere, but what is special is the scent of this lay. <laughs> I hope I'll be able to survive. <laughs> we have felt, I say this from the depths of my heart, we have felt a spirit here in you, in your song and in your behavior which we know is of God. And my beginning point this morning is to say that for all that I have studied and learned of this modern prophet, he in turn is worth studying only for one reason, that he is a window to enable us to see more clearly the life and power of Jesus Christ. And as I have titled these remarks, The Source of Spirituality, I define in advance that phrase as meaning our relationship to the living Christ, which Joseph Smith lived and died to enhance for all of us. Let me begin with a section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I do so after asking the question, how many are returned missionaries? And how many intend to be missionaries? You either know or better have memorized a section of the Doctrine and Covenants known as Section 4, which begins a great and marvelous work is about to come forth. I'd like to take the admonitions of that section and use them uh, as keys to understanding both the prophet's aspiration and his own living experiences with that. And so we begin with the overview which says that the field is white, all ready to harvest, we have at uh, BYU a young man who is black, very black, who was called on a mission to Oakland. And his first letter home to his mother said, Mother, the field is black, all ready to harvest. <laughs> the point is, 
the whole world, regardless of nationality or ethnic background, is waiting for this message. And, says the Revelation, if you embark in it, then see that you serve him with heart, might, mind, and strength. And then a list. It's actually doubled, but I'm going to take the second list. A series of virtues. Remember, it says. And the first word is faith. Now, faith clearly for the prophet was faith in God and his son. But a, a, a faith that can be defined as trust, he, that's the beginning reality when he walks into the grove. The reality of trust that promises made from God, in this case one in the book of James, can be trusted. He knelt and you know the result. Did you know that the prophet privately prayed the rest of his life for faith like Enoch's? He wanted, and in a few instances promised others, a similar faith, faith like the brother of Jared, who pierced the veil and was privileged with face-to-face -face communion. But faith like Enoch's was faith that somehow a whole people could come together in a community that would be the kingdom of God restored and would like leaven permeate the earth. Faith like Enoch. And later on Brigham Young looking back said no other man in this age, no other man has been able to bring together people of such diverse backgrounds and make them one in order and rule. Only this modern inspired prophet. The next word is virtue. And you know the admonition to him which in turn is to us, let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. The prophet once said that the things of God are of deep import and only time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can find them out. He wrote that when he was in a jail and had more time than usual to think and pray. Virtue garnishes thoughts when your thoughts, when you don't have to think about anything, focus with an eye single to the glory of God. And when you replace bad or distracting or evil thoughts with good. You can only, we know from modern psychology, think about one thing at a time. There's only one thought at a time that can be center stage in your mind. Therefore, that's a God-given privilege, if you replace evil with good, you have solved the problem of thought. He thought virtuously and had the virtue of character that is built on pure thought. The next word is knowledge, knowledge. And he said once, uh, both as an admonition and a description, I desire the wisdom and learning of heaven alone. But that was inclusive because what he was saying was that when, for example, he did study the tools for further knowledge of the things of God as of men, namely, the languages, Hebrew, some Greek, some German. He did that as an instrument toward this learning. And he became, yes, in a sense, worldly wise. He had to learn the wisdom of men as well as the things of God. One man who knew him, having seen him in court repeatedly because he was summoned over and over with often trumped up legal actions to court, he said Joseph Smith was the greatest lawyer I ever knew. And he knew Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln, among others. He learned and mastered knowledge. He often said, likewise, that a man is saved no faster than he gains knowledge. But I 
like to testify to you that the other side, the converse of that is true by his life. A man gains or a woman gains knowledge no faster than he is saved. One must himself be growing spiritually in order to understand certain things. Otherwise, they are blotted out from his understanding. Certain bounds, he taught Brigham Young, must be passed in our spiritual lives before the Lord sees fit to give to us his most cherished truths and insights. And we, mar we must become as trustworthy as we are expected to give trust to him. Temperance is the next word. Often defined, and too much so, as control of appetite or avoiding uh, spiritous liquors, as it was anciently said. Well, the prophet defined temperance more in terms of balance and control, not just of physical appetite, but control of temper, control of pressures that often arise in the daily struggle, and even endurance of trial and pain. This man, according to the testimony of, again, Brigham Young, suffered, suffered in being loyal to the living God in ways hard for us even to comprehend. He even said once that it was like setting a man loose, actually a, a fugitive, on Temple Square, a 10-acre block in Salt Lake, and then letting loose 10,000 hounds after him. That, he said, was the way the prophet's life went. He lived a thousand years in 38. He was told early on that he would have many afflictions, and so he did, but he was temperate and never bitter in the process. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, and closely related now, patience. The problem of having vision the problem of anticipating, under inspiration, great events. The problem of being able to see beyond the little the ordinary transaction to something really massive means that there is an inbuilt impatience to see it fulfilled. How the prophet yearned to see this little thing called the Mormon church grow. And how often he saw frustration when those who had begun faithful and burned brightly, then under pressure faded away. Once he said with a broken heart, brethren, he was speaking to some who had witnessed apostasy all around. Brethren, I have not apostatized yet and do not intend to. Patience, closely related to endurance. I want to add on that point that the prophet hoped and even anticipated certain blessings in his own life that because he was faithful did not come. He yearned to see the temple completed in Nauvoo. He even said, as did an ancient man, if only I can live for that and see it, I can say, Lord, it is enough, take me home. He was denied that privilege. He yearned to be the first to lead a vanguard group of pioneers out of the pressures of the east and into the Great Valley, as did Joshua. He was denied that privilege. But he again demonstrated patience and malleability under the Lord's influence. Brotherly kindness is next. Brotherly kindness find that three ways. He was, after all, a son who had brothers and sisters. If you want to know if he was a good son, then read the blessing that his father gave him close to the time of his death, which said, in effect, my son, the ancient Joseph, lived in the hope that someday a strand of his posterity would receive the fullness of the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And my son, he, the ancient Joseph, saw you 
and his heart rejoiced. And then he said, my son, you have been obedient to your mother and to me. And even when I have been out of the way, you have not laughed me to scorn, nor abandoned me. And for this, I love you, and the Lord loves you. His own brother Hiram, older, and therefore, if he followed the pattern of Lemuel, one who could have been jealous and bitter and rebellious, was instead, from the beginning, closely devoted to him from the weeks that he spent at his side and often holding him in his arms in the pain of that terrible bone operation, he and his brother Joseph became one. And as they lived together, they died together. As for his sisters, he honored and loved them and did all he could to help them, both temporally and spiritually. As for brotherly kindness defined in the sense of others, not of one's own immediate family, Joseph Smith was a brotherly man, constantly in an encouraging mode, constantly able to reach out, often with humor or with kindness. My little grandson, as you've heard, asked, tell me a story of Joseph and money. And I thought of the day that uh, brethren are gathered in Nauvoo and lamenting that a certain man's house that night had burned to the ground and with the house all of his possessions. And they were sympathizing. Oh, what a terrible thing. And the prophet walked over to a table and took $5 out of his pocket and put it on the table and said, Brethren, I am sorry to the amount of $5. How sorry are you? He didn't simply talk, he acted. I will not say I can do nothing, he once said, after having heard that sentence from the President of the United States. We can do nothing, though your cause is just. I will do all I can, so help me God. And so he did. Brotherly kindness also includes the phase and phrase of love. And love in his definition, is sometimes the pure love of Christ, which means both his for us and us for him, I take it. But it, of course, also means love for others. There is a love, he once said, to those of us who keep the faith. It is from God. That is peculiar to itself. The, real, the rest of the world doesn't fully know it or feel it. It is peculiar to its, but it is without prejudice, he said. It isn't just that birds of a feather flock together. It isn't just that we have certain similarities. It is a love from God that enables love to increase among us. And then he went on to say that this same principle gives scope to the mind. It expands our minds, our intelligences, so that we have greater liberality toward others than they do toward themselves. And then he summed up, these principles approximate nearer to the mind of God because they are like God. I remember reading of the youth in the Taylor home, who I think was then only 18 or 19. The prophet was in hiding, which meant that though he had a meal or two at the house, then to avoid being discovered, he and this boy went out into the woods tramping for most of the daylight hours. His comment is two-edged. He says, I have never enjoyed the presence of a human being as I did walking with this man. All was cheerful and jovial. One night as they came back, the mother Taylor was on the porch and the prophet saw her in the distance and said, Here, mother, here, mother, come David and Jonathan. And the young man said, I would have died for him. Brotherly love. Now, humility is the next word. Sometimes we say that means meekness, but the prophet spelled a difference. Meekness, one of the Beatitudes. 
sometimes we take to mean total restraint and submission. In fact, the prophet gave it the context of how you relate to others who give you of their hospitality. No one, he said, ever saw me criticize the food, the lodging, the drink, the hospitality of anyone. And that is the meekness of Christ. Well, Christ himself demonstrated that. But there's a living example, a couple that had been flooded and then driven out of their homes in Jackson County are now almost bereft and the prophet drops into their home for breakfast. All they have is mush. And when the prophet indicates he'd like to have a bite with them, he sees the knowing look between mother and daughter. And immediately he says, Mother, I love mush. Let's eat mush. And he ate heartily. And they thought to relieve their embarrassment. That's meekness. But there is humility, too. And what is that? The recognition, the prophet taught us, that we are, in fact, dependent on God. We constantly, as we grow up, think that strength consists in denying that. We will be our own person. We don't depend on anyone. We talk as if we can live without breathing and that we can breathe without air. We cannot. We cannot survive in the real world without the blessing of the living God and his spirit. That is genuine humility, but there's more. It means that you do not swagger, you do not use whatever advantages you have of learning or of skill to embarrass others. That you, in a meeting, for example, and these happen frequently in the School of the Prophets, both with men and women, you do not take the whole time to yourself, but you involve the thoughts and feelings of others. They literally went around the circle in those days each one speaking in turn about a given theme, that when all had spoken, all might be edified of all. The prophet does not pull rank if he is properly humble. He shares and learns from others as well as from God. But there's something even more about humility. It comes from a sense of mission. And he had that, and he taught that all of us should have it. He taught, if I read him correctly, there isn't one person in this room that came into the world by accident or who was living totally at random. You came by assignment at a time and in circumstances that would enable you with your specific gifts to make your contribution. But that saves you then from jealousy and hostility to others who have different missions and different gifts. And in fact, if you are humble, it enables you to profit and be blessed by others without envying them their status. That was his attitude. And he was once criticized in Nauvoo by his critics who said, well, he is a foolish man, Joe Smith. But he is surrounded by some very smart men. And his comment was, well, I'm a smart enough fool to surround myself with smart men. And now, diligence is the last word. Diligence. Think what he did in those years. The church is organized in 1830. He is dead in 1844. Fourteen years is all he had. Fourteen years. That may seem a long time to you. It is the snap of a finger, I tell you. He arose from his bed each day with the weight of the kingdom upon his shoulders, and he worked and struggled and labored. There was no or little leisure. I have a letter only recently discovered when he writes to Emma in hiding and says he is so weighed down with the struggles of his time that 
he wants for six months just to withdraw, take his family, go somewhere. He didn't say Hawaii, but he was thinking the Garden of Eden like this. Never happened. Couldn't happen. Diligence to the end. I've often wondered how much he slept, how much he tossed and turned. I often wondered how much he was interrupted in whatever task at hand by crisis, emergency involvements. All this energy that he gave, he gave because his understanding was you have to place it upon the altar, all of it, in order for you to become truly spiritual. Which leads me to my last point. As I have read, and I have read carefully, the last four years of the prophet's teaching and activity, it is clearer and clearer to me that the culmination of everything in his mind and heart and in his understanding of the will of God for us was the temple. I wanted to speak to you in greater depth about his prayer life, and there isn't time now for that. But the temple, he was told by Revelation, was to become a house of prayer as well as a house of order and a house of glory and a house of fasting and a house of learning and ultimately a place where all could be endowed with power from on high. He summed up his testimony on this by saying, we need the temple more than anything else. And it took primacy in his sermons and primacy in his actions. He and his brother Hiram went house to house in the last days of Nauvoo, literally as home teachers, pleading with the saints, young and old, to give of time, to give of energy, to give of resources, to see that the temple was completed. It was his faith and his conviction that had they not done that, they would not have been able to survive spiritually, whatever might be said physically, and would never have successfully crossed the plains. It was his conviction that God in this generation wants to endow us with power like unto his. That is the power of godliness. And it only flows to us, as he taught, through certain ordinances. The whole Christian world wants to come to Christ. The whole Christian world speaks about the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, and even the power of Christ. But when the question is raised, how does that finally link itself? How do you and I receive it? They certainly do not say through ordinances, starting with baptism, and they certainly do not say with and through in its fullness the house of God, but he did. He died to, de to dedicate ground and build temples that Christ himself might manifest himself in mercy to all of us. That was the source, ultimately, of his spirituality as it can be of ours. I bear my testimony, brothers and sisters, that this man both taught and emulated the virtues of the doctrine and covenants, that he had faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, humility, and diligence, and that out of those came his ever-expanding spirituality until the Lord could say to him, as he did, I seal upon you your exaltation. That promise, brothers and sisters, we all can aspire to. In righteousness, I pray that we will. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this hour. We are grateful for Brother and Sister Madsen. We thank thee for their lives for their messages and pray for thy spirit to continue to be with them that while they visit these islands that they may be refreshed and edified and we might continue to so be from their visit. 
We're thankful for these opportunities, for this important university and the destiny that it has. We are thankful for the love and unity that we feel here. And we pray that we might be able to apply the example of Brother Joseph in our lives as we seek to come closer to thee. As we draw this semester to a close, as faculty, may we be just and merciful where appropriate in our assessments. And wilt thou bless each student that they may be able to celebrate and display their knowledge. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.